This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Diane Orson in today for Lucy Now Pathanchel. Schools are reopening across Connecticut, and one thing parents know for sure is that this will be a year like none other. And not only because the nation is amid a public health crisis with the coronavirus pandemic, we're also amid a long overdue and urgent national reckoning with the ongoing effects of systemic racism, which also profoundly affects public health and the health of children. The American Academy of Pediatrics calls racism a core social determinant of health that's a driver of health inequities. Still, parents often struggle to talk with their kids about racism and related issues in meaningful ways. Today, where we live, we'll explore why, and we'll hear how we, as parents, can prepare for ongoing critical conversations with our children about issues related to racism. I'm joined now by Dr. T. Dumont Matthew, a developmental behavioral pediatrician at Connecticut Children's and associate professor at the Yukon School of Medicine. Welcome to where we live. Thank you for having me. We as parents have tough conversations all the time with our kids. What is it about this stuff? Why is talking about racism so difficult for so many of us? And of course, not talking about something sends its own message. I think tough conversations for us as parents uh, often require us to get out of our comfort zones. You know, we have to be uncomfortable, deal with uncomfortable feelings, uncomfortable thoughts. They often require us to engage in self-reflection, and these often are topics we don't really want to (laughs) reflect too much on. And uh, they sometimes raise fear of saying or doing the wrong thing with our children and possibly harming them in that way. So, you know, if you think about a parent who uh, wants to discuss smoking with their child but was a smoker, they may fear their child will view them negatively or accuse them of being a hypocrite and, um, you know, being told not to do something that they perhaps did themselves when they were young. Um, But what we have to remember, as you said, is that not talking about something sends its own message. You know, simply not discussing a subject does not mean our children won't learn about it. They just won't learn about it from us. Um, They'll learn from other people, their perspective, their views of of looking at that issue. And so, and and sometimes um, when we don't discuss something, our children walk away with the wrong impression. So again, if we think of parents who may be undergoing a divorce, the children almost certainly notice there's a difference. They they can feel the tension. Uh, they know something is wrong, but they're not sure what. And so they may start thinking it's them. It has to do with them, something they've done, that they're the cause of the tension. Um, so for us as parents, sometimes silence can actually be more harmful than having these tough conversations. And another matter uh, right up front I want to talk about is overcoming defensiveness in conversations uh, related to racism, particularly for white parents who may say to themselves, I'm not racist, but white people benefit from the privilege of whiteness. We know that even if they're not consciously aware of it because it's just so kind of baked into the cake of our lives. So how do white parents acknowledge the fact that we benefit from white privilege, even if we're not actively engaging in racist acts? So to start with, I I think it's important. uh, You mentioned the American Academy of Pediatrics statement. It's important for us to make sure we're understanding the terminology we're using. So the the American Academy of Pediatrics discusses three levels uh, at which racism can operationalize. Institutional racism, which has to do with um, children they experience, uh, I should say, through their, where they live, where they learn, what they have, how their rights are executed. Implicit and explicit personally mediated racism, which is often what we think of when we think of racism, which has to do with assumptions you know, uh, one may have about another group and their abilities, motives, their intent. Uh, and then internalized racism, which which is the internalizing of racial stereotypes about one's own racial group. So setting that aside, we have to also remember, by the way, that children will pick up on that defensiveness if we have it, <laughs> and they may learn to mimic it. Um, so I would say let's look at this a little bit differently. If If you're a white parent who's struggling with understanding the perspective of a black parent whose child 
is coming across the impact of systemic racism in their neighborhood or town, in their classroom, a parent who has a teenager and is nervous about letting them drive. You know, think about this as a parent. When we as parents close our eyes and think about our children, our hearts just expand, right? We feel like our heart's going to burst. So now ask yourself, you know, what degree of pain would you be willing to let your precious child feel? How many things do, you know, do you want them, how many things do you want them to have to their sense of who they are? Um, Because things are better today than in the past and things are getting better. We are learning how to treat each other better as an American family every day. Um, And to get to the next level, we, we have to all be all in. It's like we're in a family. Everyone has to um, be focused on, on helping that child grow and thrive and feel protected. So, you know, and if we go to the most basic level of well, what's in it for me, we know that racially diverse uh, communities, environments, racially just environments benefit everyone because racism impacts the child directly who may be feeling the effects of the systemic racism but it also impacts the children who are bystanders to that, who witness the injustice, and that also impacts who they become as adults. You're listening to Where We Live. I'm Diane Orson, in for Lucy Nalpathanchel. We're talking today about how we as parents can prepare for meaningful conversations with our children about racism. My guest is Dr. T. Dumont Matthew, a developmental behavioral pediatrician. You've said that as we prepare for these conversations, we need to think back on our goals and objectives as parents and what parenting is about for us. So as parents, you know, we love our children. You know, it's our job to keep them safe, to make them feel that love, that sense of safety, to make them feel cherished. And part of what we do as parents is to pass along to our children, you know, the next generation, our belief system, our values, our views of the world and and our sense of our place in that world and what their place will be in that world. We are guides of sorts to start them off on their life journey. So we have to remember that the broad goals we have as parents are the same broad goals that other parents have, you know, and that our parents had for themselves as they raised us. So one of the things that we have to learn um, to do as we engage in many of these ongoing difficult conversations um, that we'll have with our children is to separate our feelings towards our parents and and their parenting from what what we may choose to pass on to our children. You know, so when I'm discussing behavior management or discipline with families, I I often remind them that, you know, you can love your parents and continue to love them dearly while recognizing that you are going to speak to your child, discipline or teach your child differently than how your parents did it. And that's, that's okay. As we learn, we grow, we change. So similarly, parents may be differently aware of how some racialized words are hurtful, you know, some racialized actions and inactions are harmful. So now you will parent your children differently. Um, you know, as we gain a different level of awareness and focus and mindfulness and commitment to certain principles, we're going to implement them through our parenting differently. So what are some of the general principles that parents should keep in mind when they're talking about racism with their children? Well, first of all, um, we should take a moment and talk about development, because when we're talking about discussing anything with children, we have to start with where they are in terms of their development and what they're able to comprehend and understand. I do think we tend to underestimate what typically developing children are capable of socially, emotionally, what they're aware of. So in, in many ways, we can think of the first year as the year that children are becoming aware of their immediate environment related to getting their needs met. You know, the key players in their world, their parents, caregivers, they're recognizing faces, voices, watching movement around them, developing stranger anxiety, um, smiling back. Those are all social emotional skills um, that tell us that children are watching, they're noticing. They're noticing familiar and different. And that different is neutral at that point, right? There is no problem in noticing and acknowledging difference. Um, Between one and three, among other things, children are engaging at a different level and and they're starting to have a broader circle. 
Um, you know, 15 month olds are showing empathy, for example, between one and a half and three kids are focused on play and it's all about play. They're playing functionally with toys. They're playing with other kids, you know, initially in parallel, but then more and more interactively, they're engaging in pretend play. Um, and with that comes opportunities for us as parents to help them work on frustration, sharing, conflict resolution. Um, four to six-year-olds, I call those the friendship years in many ways. They have a preferred friend or a group of friends. You know, kids start wanting to, to be like their friends or do things like their friends. Um, so you can see a lot of the scene setting we've talked about um, come into play at, at this time. And uh, 6 to 12-year-olds are more and more recognizing feelings in others, developing empathy. I call those the empathy years. And then middle school and high school, the, I call them the analytical years, right? The kids are more and more um, analyzing what they're seeing, trying to understand what they're seeing, trying to figure out how to change what they may see and feel isn't right. Um, and so we have to keep all of that in mind when we discuss you know, any topic with our kids if we want them to really take it in and understand it. Can you just talk briefly about appropriately framing conversations with our kids about racism um, so that they're age appropriate, for example? So I would say the thing to remember is that in many ways, uh, we already have been giving messages to our children, right, through the choices we have or haven't made. We, you know, so I would say it's important to really make sure you're engaging in self-reflection. You know, what have been your experiences with race and racism? Observe our experience, right? You know, commit to small, consistent, sustainable change. That's the backdrop. Um, but more specifically, especially with a younger child, you know, you want to make sure that you think of this as one of many conversations that you're going to look for teachable moments day after day to really highlight the key points. You want to make it a conversation. I always say you should listen twice as much as you talk. <laughs> Create the mm -hmm. space for your kids to share with you, ask questions, to think out loud and feel safe about it. You know, get a sense of what they know, don't know, what they may have heard. It's important for us to, to actively choose not to lie to our children, right? If we're not sure about the answer to the question they're asking, or maybe we're not even sure what the question is, we need to get clarification from them before we start to answer. And if we're not sure what the answer is or how to answer the question, we should tell them, you know, that we're not, that we're going to get back to them and then actually get back to them. You know, it's important if we're talking specifically about racism that we don't uh, inadvertently reinforce stereotypes when we're discussing this topic with our children. You know, I, I often advise parents to, to try to, to avoid creating a good people, bad people narrative based mm -hmm. on race, ethnicity, because generalizations are problematic. Most, you know, families and communities aren't all one race or another. So that, that doesn't really hold out and doesn't work. Instead, let's focus on people's words, their actions or inactions, their choices, decisions, life circumstances, and then flip the perspective. So if your child asks, you know, why were white and black children not able to go to the same school in the old days, right? First, you know, you want to ask them what they think about that or what are your thoughts on that? And then, you know, the conversation might progress to discussing how sad it, it would have been if their, you know, if they, a white child, wasn't able to meet and play with their friend who happens to be a black child, or if they, a black child, wasn't able to meet and play with their friend who happens to be a white child. Help them view integration as a win-win by flipping the perspective. Uh, and then the natural next step may be to ask them to help you make a list of, you know, what makes a good friend? Hmm, let's make a list. What makes a good friend? Let's start with your good friends and you list them. And hopefully it's a diverse list, right? What makes them a good friend to you? And when the list is done, you might casually ask them, do you think a child's skin color is important in deciding if they're a good friend or not? You know, what do you think? Uh, and, and when I'm having this conversation with a child, I then often say, hmm, because they'll often say no, right? And they'll say, I knew it. You're smarter than some of those adults were back then. You know, they didn't know that it's being kind, having things you both enjoy doing. You know, you go back to the list the child made. Those, those are the things that make a good friend and not the color of someone's skin. How silly, you know, and the kids beam, right? They, they, 
because they really do think they're smarter than a lot of us. <laughs> so, so for <laughs> a young are. child, you know, that might be the approach to take, you know, if the child's like late preschool, early school age, um, and they've raised the issue with a question like that. And you can see how the questions and the conversations will vary and differ as the child gets older, but the principles will remain the same. You know, the details and the depth of analysis will grow with the child, but that's true for, for every topic. Before we take our break, I do want to just talk briefly about vocabulary. What vocabulary may come up, or more importantly, what words do you think should come up in conversations about racism? So I, I think the, the words that will often pop first up, you know, to the top of the list are things that are related to racism. So prejudice, you know, you know, this prejudging someone, <laughs> you know, discriminating, you know, um, explicit or implicit, um, or or sometimes people refer to as unconscious bias, you know, those terms will, will, will be important because often they're discussed as if they all mean the same thing. And they, of course, they, they don't, but also I think important words, because those also come up in lots of different other teachable moments. So you can make the linkages is just awareness. Right? I mean, we when we teach kids to be kind, we first help them to notice if their friend looks sad, right? And then acknowledge, oh, you seem sad, and then reach out, what's wrong? Can I help? Right? And then you you know do the act of kindness, whether it's a hug or saying a kind word. You know, being empathetic, right? We're teaching kids that lots of different ways all the time. Um, and, and we just need to extend it to include this area, which we often don't in a proactive um, or mindful way, mindful way. But we also need to include fairness, you know, justice and what these terms mean, because kids very early on have a sense of fairness. If you offer two kids an unfair situation, they, they know it. They can pick up on it pretty quickly. And if you give them the space, they'll tell you how to make it more fair. You know, I have two boxes of crayons. One is broken, one is brand new. And there are two of you. You know, how do we fairly distribute these crayons? They'll problem solve that for you. And if you just hand one child that box randomly or based on some premise, um, they'll notice that and they'll see the unfairness of it, even if it's the child who got the perfect crayons. So we need to really make sure that our conversations are broad and interlinked so that this discussing, you know, racism, bias and these issues are not set aside conversations, but that they're ongoing integral part of our teachable moments with our kids. We have to take a short break here. Don't go away. We're exploring how we as parents can prepare to have meaningful conversations with our children about racism. My guest is developmental behavioral pediatrician, Dr. T. Dumont Matthew. Joining our conversation after the break, NPR TV critic Eric Deggins, author of the book Race Bader. Please stay with us. From Connecticut Public Radio, this is Where We Live. I'm Diane Orson, in for Lucy Nalpathanchel. We're talking today about preparing as parents for meaningful conversations with our children about racism. My guests are Dr. T. Dumont Matthew, developmental behavioral pediatrician at Connecticut Children's and associate professor at the Yukon School of Medicine. And we'd like to welcome now Eric Deggins, NPR TV critic and author of the book Race Baiter, How the Media Wields Dangerous Words to Divide a Nation. Eric Deggins, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. In your recent Life Kit podcast, Eric, you say not racist is not enough. You need to put in the work to be an anti-racist. Why anti-racist? Um, it just emphasizes the idea that simply saying that um, your politics or your viewpoint is that you're not racist doesn't do anything to dismantle the system of racism that we all live in. To you know, um, emphasize the idea that you have to sort of act- actively take action to try and disrupt the system which American society typically works which is to elevate white culture above other cultures and to present white culture as, as the norm or as uh, an example of quality and achievement. So engaging in this idea of, of anti-racism means uh, at first sort of realizing and accepting the idea 
that we are all socialized to elevate white culture uh, from our uh, youngest years, uh, because that's how American society tends to work. As a media expert, what role do you think the media plays in these conversations that we as parents are having with our children about racism? Do you have tips or warnings for uh, how it relates to the way kids learn about racism from media? Well, I mean, the media works with children the same way it works with adults, which is that it, it is constantly using the values and the perspectives that it knows that we have uh, about race, about difference, about gender, and, and using those messages to speak to us. And so in, in speaking to us, it also winds up sort of perpetuating and communicating all the biases and prejudices that we all have. And it becomes this weird feedback loop where, um, you know, there, there's sort of an inherent elevation of white culture that happens in American society. And then that is, is transmitted to everyone through media products. You know, you think about, um, you know, Marvel's super successful superhero films. Um, you know, it, it took a long time. You know, they started making superhero films with Iron Man something like 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, it took until Black Panther uh, for us to get a, a superhero film that starred a black character. Uh, and so we had this litany of big budget, major, hundreds of millions of dollars spent on these superhero films that starred white males as the exemplar of strength and truth and intelligence and, 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 uh, and heroism. And, and, and those films not only were uh, reaching kids and adults across America, they were also going across the world and influencing people. And so that's one way in which, um, you know, a, a, an ethic that elevates whiteness can start in a piece of media, which actually is transmitting uh, an ethic that was created in another piece of media, a comic book. So you have, so you have the comic book transmit the idea to the movie, which transmits the idea to the people who view it, who then walk around thinking their vision of a hero is a white male like Tony Stark or like uh, Thor or like Spider-Man. And then the next thing you know, they go out and create more media that reinforces that same idea. And the only way you really stop that cycle is to have people realize what it is, accept what it is, and then work to disrupt it. Um, in other words, having somebody like Ryan Coogler and, and, and the great uh, late lamented Chadwick Boseman come along and embody and create Black Panther and disrupt that. And and you know, the, the, it took the executives at Marvel and and um, uh, and the producers at Marvel Studios to to uh, buy into that vision and support it. And then it took the fans to realize what was happening and have them buy in and support it too. So it's not enough to just say that you're not racist. You have to sort of actively get involved wherever your sphere of influence is. You may not be a producer at Marvel Studios or an actor, but you might be able to, to go to your PTA meeting and elevate the voices of the non-white people, the non-white parents who are in that room. Or you might be able to go to your church and encourage your church to do events where, you know, you might attend a, a, a black church or, att or attend a church that's filled with non-white people. Or, you know, if you're someone who hires people or you're someone who rents an apartment to people, you might make sure that you give fair consideration to the people of color uh, when they apply for a job and when they try to get an apartment in your complex. They're, you know, wherever you have power, you can be a voice for anti-racism versus just saying that you're not racist. And that transfers into how you talk to your children. And I, I really feel that, you know, there's a component of parenting. I mean, I've got four kids myself, and there's a component of parenting where you're actively trying to tell them things. And of course, we wish they would listen to us more <laughs> when, we, <laughs> when we actively try to tell them things. And then there's a component where they watch what you do. You know, when they see you being anti-racist in the world, that's a powerful example whether or not you actually articulate those ideas to them. So very likely conversations about racism and race related issues may begin at home, not with a parent initiating the conversation, but maybe watching something on television or from the movies and offering a comment or question. And I'm wondering, both of you, what your thoughts are about preparing for that moment. 
Um, well, I've, I've always said, you know, a lot of parenting is how you react to things that your kids do. So if they if they come to you and they've hurt themselves, you know, uh, playing soccer or something, how you react is, is how they take cues on how to react. So if you're calm and measured and, uh, and soothing, then they get the sense that, hey, it's going to be all right and it's not such a bad thing. Well, you know, if, if they have a question about race and they come to you and they ask that question about race, how you react is really important. And, you know, I'm African-American. I was married for a long time to a white woman. We have four kids who um, some of them were adopted and some of them, uh, you know, one of them's a yeah, biological kid, but they were all kind of raised in a biracial household. So we always talked about race as, a, you know, it was never anything special. We always talked about it, but I know um, that in some uh, households, maybe particularly in white households, it might not be like that. You know, race might not be a subject that gets talked about very much. So, you know, when your child brings it up, be open minded about it. React well. It's not something unsavory. It's not something that is impolite to talk about. You know, uh, it may make you uncomfortable on some level, but that may just be because you haven't talked about it or thought about it enough. It should be uh, something that you're able to talk about in a relaxed, open, even a fun way. Uh, I am always drawn to this example that's in Robin DeAngelo's book. Robin DeAngelo wrote the book White Fragility, and she's a white uh, diversity trainer who has written a book about how to talk to white people about race because there are so many defense mechanisms that can spring up when white people try to talk about race because um, uh, white people often actively uh, try to avoid it. So uh, one of the things she talks about is a moment when a child may be out in public and see somebody who's a different color and finally realize that and point it out. And then the white parent may sort of freak out and try to shut that conversation down. And that's really not the best way to react uh, when something like that happens. Because again, the child is taking cues from how you react. So if you see that racial difference is something that A, is logical, uh, that person is obviously a different color uh, than you and your child are, um, that it, it's a cool thing to, to, um, to recognize that somebody's different and they might have some really cool things about their life or their experience that you could experience and learn from. And, and it's, it can be a wonderful, cool, very um, adventurous thing to get to know somebody who's different than you. So you don't try to downplay the difference. You don't try to act like it's something unsavory or something uh, that, that you don't talk about in polite company. You say, yeah, obviously we look different and it may mean that we have uh, you know, cultural differences or differences in our family heritage, but we're all human and it's a wonderful thing to meet people who are different than you. Dr. DeMont Matthew, did you want to add anything? I, I do. I, I tend to Think of sort of the younger child, when we're, you know, as we're talking about this, because as we talked about, it's a little different depending on the child's age. But I do agree that, I, you know, I think the initial thing for us to do as parents in terms of preparing for meaningful conversations about racism and related issues is to assess our situation, to do a survey, right? So we know that if we, if we count up how many books that are in a household, it will give us some sense of how important reading might be. Of course, there are lots of reasons someone may not have a lot of books in their home, right? It's not that they don't value reading, but, you know, there are programs that are developed to help get books into children's homes because we understand the value of that. So similarly, I think parents really can start by setting the scene again uh, in terms of what books they have in their home, right? Paying attention to having books that reflect uh, diversity just for its own sake, not just books about civil rights leaders, et cetera, right? But just a story about a young girl who's a scientist and is black or a story about a young girl who is an artist or plays an instrument, right? So having books, having, uh, you know, your choice of music and shows that the children watch and movies that they may, may watch all sort of set the baseline as to what is typical and really understanding whether your settings and the circles you're moving about in are really reflecting the priority you feel this is so that your child should hopefully not only see a person that looks different than them walking down the street, but 
you know, maybe in the in the circles of friends you have and, and you know, organizations you participate in. I think we have to be proactive as parents in general and, you know, not reactionary, but really, you know, stay ahead of things and really be thinking ahead, mindfully planning and self-reflecting because it is absolutely, we are the, the person kids look to to decide how they should feel about things that are different or new to them. I would also say that part of being anti-racist, in fact, would be making sure that you have a friend circle that's diverse, would be uh, making sure that your child has a lot of contact with people who are from different cultures and different ethnicities anyway. But there will come a point where that young child will begin to notice that not only that there's a difference in appearance, but that in their own way, they'll realize that there is a significance attached to that difference in appearance. There's one moment when uh, a child doesn't really understand that the difference in skin color also denotes other differences and, and differences in the way that the world sees people. And then there's a moment when they do. And they'll have questions once they make that connection. And, and being prepared for those questions, I think, is important. And I also think that, you know, if you, if you do what the doctor says and, and kind of already have an environment that's rich in, in cultural difference and diversity, when they have those questions, uh, you'll be prepared to answer them. And their questions will probably be more sophisticated anyway. That's great. We have to take a break, but please stay with us. This is where we live. More still ahead with NPR TV critic and author Eric Deggins and developmental behavioral pediatrician Dr. T. Dumont Matthew on preparing for meaningful conversations with our children about racism. I'm Diane Orson. Don't go away. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Diane Orson, in for Lucine Alpathanchel. My guests are Dr. T. Dumont Matthew, a developmental behavioral pediatrician, and Eric Deggins, NPR TV critic and author of the book Race Bader. We're talking today about what we as parents can and should do to prepare for meaningful conversations with our kids about racism. So we've been talking about the fact that kids watch what you do really more than what you say. Let's talk about active steps we can take as parents to prepare for conversations with young people about racism and meeting those moments when they raise these questions well. Dr. DeMont Matthew, you want to start this off? Sure. I, I think anything we want to teach our children, you know, has to begin with us having a commitment to teaching to, the, to our children, right? So we have to decide that this is something that's important to focus on in a conscious and active way. Because again, remember, even if we don't choose to focus on it, it is not something that is not happening around us already and that our children are not seeing, hearing. Children learn through their senses. So they're very aware of things that we often um, have put in the background for ourselves, um, but they're definitely aware of it. It's so self-reflection is important. You know, you talked earlier about understanding privilege that comes with whiteness in the society and the defensiveness that often accompanies that when it's discussed. But that is an important thing to reflect on because it is difficult to, to, to do um, the clarifications that Mr. Deggins is describing if you haven't sort of arrived at an opinion yourself about it in a conscious way, right? So what do you think? I mean, do you really think they should treat all their friends the same or shouldn't they, right? Um, kids can tell what we mean if it's different than what we say. <laughs> they really can tell. They can sense that. They know it. And related to that, we have to really learn about history, right? Because a lot of the questions will, you know, come from them coming across something where they try to understand some event in, that's happened in the past and to contextualize it, especially as children get into middle and high school. So we have to have an understanding of American history in the broad sense of it, right? There is no such thing as Asian American history, African American history. There's American history. And then there's a tendency to discuss, you know, a subset of American history as the sort of main history. And then other things are sort of appendages to that. But it's really... There's an American family, and there's a story for how we came to be family. And there are different aspects of that history that impact different 
um, members of that family, so to speak. And it is it is like explaining your family tree where you don't talk about everyone. It it, it sends the, the wrong message, right? We need to, to be clear about that. And sometimes we have to actually first learn that. Um, and then, you know, as we said, it has to be a conversation. Um, and I, I, I agree with, with what uh, Mr. Degan says. It can't be just us lecturing our kids because you know, they'll disengage and rightfully so because they, they are thinking beings and they have, you know, opinions and questions worth pondering and discussing. So it has to be a conversation, uh, conversations, plural, um, and we have to follow our child's lead. But as we do with other things as parents, we sometimes put things in their, in their mind's eye that they may not otherwise have, you know, prioritized. Yeah, you know, um, one of the things that strikes me, uh, and I guess it's because I'm a TV and media critic, is that um, if your kids ask you questions that you don't necessarily know the answers to, then you can discover the answers together. And, and, and that can be a way in which you learn and your child learns and you guys learn to, together. So part of it can be, you know, both of you guys reading books that might educate you a little bit about these issues of race and racism. Or one thing that was um, really powerful was when I watched uh, the miniseries Roots with my kids. Uh, now my kids are grown now, but we watched it when they were much younger, old enough to be able to handle the violence and you know some of the intense situations that are depicted in the show, uh, but, but young enough that they were just starting to study that stuff in school and, and seeing uh, a mini series like Roots that um, you know was about the family history, uh, Alex Haley's family history, and goes all the way back to when one of his ancestors was captured in Africa and brought to America and forced to work as a slave, and then started a family that that led down to him. Um, you know that 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 gave a great idea of how slavery worked, about how um, anti-black racism, you know, first kind of emerged in America, how it had a very commercial component to it, all of these things that now we're struggling with, you know, the criminalization of, of blackness, the ways in which American society elevates, um, even poor white people to try and sever uh, a connection between working class white people and working class black people, you know, all of that, believe it or not, is in roots. And if you watch it, um, with your child, you, all those ideas and those questions and stuff can sort of come up. And then the other thing that that strikes me is that, um, you know, we, we didn't have that many sort of direct talks about race with our kids because we were very much living an actively anti-racist life in a lot of ways. But um, but we also introduced our kids to, to gay friends and gay culture. And one of the things that struck me is that um, you know, we just, we always had gay friends in our lives. We always um, hung out at their homes and, 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 you know, did things together. And we always uh, went to the gay pride parade. It was just kind of, uh, it was just part of our lives. We never really made a big deal out of it. A lot of our friends were gay. And so it just happened that way. And, and I was pleased to notice that when my kids grew into adults, they had um, a really great sense of, um, you know, being fair to gay folks and standing up against homophobia and supporting uh, same-sex marriage and, you know, all this other stuff that you would hope your kids would do to advance equality in a society. They, they already went there because when they were kids, we, we, were, we were just hanging out and we were mm -hmm. all equal and we were all enjoying each other. And so that was really instructive to me as to how you can show kids, you can show kids without even actually telling them by living the life that you uh, hope that they might live. We're talking today about preparing as parents for meaningful conversations with our children about racism. Dr. Dumont Matthew, did you want to say something? I, I was I was going to uh, reiterate something, but you know, there's jo you know, jokingly, there's always the whole, the media and pediatrics thing, right? <laughs> where, where, so I agree a hundred percent that we should learn together. But, you know, putting on my pediatric hat for young kids, you know, there are lots of movies that I, you know, unrelated to this topic that I will have parents go pre-watch, right? Make sure it's actually okay for your child, right? Because there is a tension there and every child is different. There is a range in terms of developmental functioning. And we have to always remember that 
these things that for us as adults, we've kind of gotten acclimated to are, are very stark, very uh, traumatic things for some of our kids to, to first come into contact with and learn about. I mean, slavery is a very violent <laughs> the history, right? Um, and so I think for young children especially, you know, we have to be truthful and accurate, but we definitely, right, we don't talk about things the same way with six-year-olds as we do with 16-year-olds for a reason. So, you know, watching things ahead of time and making sure that, that it is age-appropriate in terms of the potential for trauma, especially if we think about children of color, you know, they're quite trying to figure out their sense of who they are. And so they may, you know, juxtapose that you know, what they're seeing in terms of the past into who they are now, and that's potentially problematic. But I do think we have to be truthful, accurate, and we do want to learn t together. Sometimes we learn together with a, you know, pause in between so that we can really make sure we've, uh, we've sort of previewed, processed, and, and, and then uh, we're sometimes able to translate that information in an age-appropriate way. Because we also want to make sure we're careful about not reinforcing stereotypes you know, as, you know, Mr. Deggins was talking about earlier, you know, um, unwittingly, sometimes we reinforce stereotypes by even the questions we ask, right? Because our three, four-year-old may not have had any, they've noticed difference, of course, we talked about that, but they never thought there was a negative connotation. And then when you start talking about how the difference doesn't matter, then they, it's kind of like, well, why is this even an, uh, an issue, right? So which is why it's important sometimes to let them lead the conversation when they're young. So you kind of have a sense of where they are. Um, so you don't start the conversation beyond where they have been. Um, and then uh, lastly, we, you know, I often talk about flipping the perspective um, as a way to avoid those, those, those stereotyping uh, potentials by, you know, talking about how it would have felt to not have your friend, you know, in your life so that you're not talking about the fact that kids didn't go to school together as if it was only harmful to one group, because in some ways it was harmful to both groups, because, again, we're a family, and so we're impacting each other. Um, and, yes, some people are impacted more negatively. That's the whole idea of systemic racism and the effects of it. Um, but if we're trying to teach our children and want them to go forward in a different way. It's important that we're very um, honest, accurate, um, but very thoughtful. Eric, yeah, I, I would agree with that. But I, I would also say that um, one thing I've learned from being a media critic for a long time is that kids, even young kids, are already exposed to messages about this um, from the moment they start watching television, from the moment they start taking in media. And, and sometimes that's deliberate, you know, shows like Sesame Street, for example, uh, very deliberately talk about how great it is to have a wide diversity of friends and what it's like to be friends with somebody who's different and, um, you know, how that works. So by the time you as a parent are ready to sit down and talk with your kids about it, they've already gotten messaging through media and through um, their everyday lives about this stuff. So you definitely be careful about what you uh, about what material you, you introduce to them, but also be aware that they may be further along and thinking about these ideas just because uh, of the media they're consuming and the world that we live in. Uh, before we wrap up, Dr. Dumont Matthew, you've told me that one of the reasons you love your job is that as parents, we are our best selves or trying to be. Can you talk about allowing parents the space to start to make changes and still holding people accountable. In other words, balancing and understanding that this will be a long and hard process, but there'll be mistakes along the way. Right. So I think as parents, you know, we, I, I do think that we manage to be our best selves as, as humans, as parents in our parenting role. We want the best for our children. And yes, what, you know, sometimes, you know, that needs to be tweaked in terms of, you know, how we implement it. But we definitely, I think most parents want what's best for their children. We're, we're motivated to make changes that we may not even make for our own health because of the impact on our children. I, I think about someone who may have a child who has asthma and is a smoker and their child's asthma attacks motivate them to really work on 
cessation of their smoking, um, which is a difficult thing to do. So I, I do think that um, we need to model that as well for our kids, that this isn't a simple, quick fix. So it, it is something that needs to be addressed because it is causing harm. So just like if you if your child hurts another friend, you first help them to acknowledge and apologize to that friend, right, and not start explaining why they, they hurt the friend as if that's okay. So we do need to to understand that hundreds of years of history isn't going to change in one day. But on the other hand, the journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. You have to take a step. You have to make a commitment and initiate and change what is, as Mr. Degan says, change what's in your sphere of influence today. You know, survey today as a parent. Um, be mindful of what's coming out of your mouth and your actions and, and what they, and sometimes we're not even aware, right, that, that there are these double meanings to a lot of the words we use. Um, but, uh, you know, it's clearly understood and received that way. It's like this kind of background noise that we need to, we need to really change that in an active way. So, you know, it, it, we, we, one of the things we try to teach our children is to not judge others. Just, just judging in itself isn't necessarily helpful. Um, but we do have to acknowledge what is and commit to changing it and start changing it right away. The minute we're aware of something, we can start working on it. The only thing I could think to add would be that um, if you're gonna be active and you're gonna be out there trying to be anti-racist and trying to teach your kids how to, how to do this, um, there are gonna be times when you make a mistake and uh, learning how to, to acknowledge a mistake and, um, and sort of gracefully correct without being defensive, without getting to feeling too guilty, you know, just kind of handle the mistake um, and, uh, and and acknowledge it and maybe explain it if your child has experienced it and then move on. That's also really important because these are complex subjects that we're talking about and complex situations that we're talking about. So nobody's going to do this perfectly and nobody's going to talk about this perfectly every time they open their mouth. But if you uh, uh, are, are willing to admit mistakes gracefully and, and, and correct when necessary, then your child learns that too. And that's, that's a really important component of this process because everybody, I mean, the thing I'm always emphasizing when I talk about this is that we have all been socialized to elevate white culture, not just white people. And so we all have this sort of weird thought processes going on sometimes when we engage with the world, because from the moment we've emerged into it, we came out into a society that was already doing this stuff. And, and once you reach a point where you're aware of it, you try to actively unwind that programming in your mind and dismantle it in your environment, but you're gonna make mistakes, you know? And, and, and learning how to admit those mistakes and recover from them is important because the only way to not make a mistake is to not try. And, and that really shouldn't be an option these days. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. I want to thank our guests, Dr. T. Dumont Matthew, developmental behavioral pediatrician at Connecticut Children's and associate professor at the UConn School of Medicine, and Eric Deggins, NPR TV critic and author of Race Bader, How the Media Wields Dangerous Words to Divide a Nation. This is where we live. I'm Diane Orson, in for Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today's show is produced by Carmen Baskoff. Our technical producer is Kat Pastor. Check out wnpr.org slash where we live for more about the show. And thanks for listening.